All right. Um, so this is the last event in our week of uh, orientation events about postgraduate courses. So um, uh, it's called a week because it's slightly over a week. And this is the last event, which is to give you an introduction to the Psychology of Advertising Masters. So um, my name is Patrick Monaghan. I'm chair of our recruitment public engagement in the Department of Psychology. And this is Leslie Hallam, who's the program director for Psychology of Advertising Masters course. So yeah, thanks for joining us in the room <laughs> and online and also watching this afterwards. Um, if you've got any questions at any point, then please uh, do ask us and I'll give you some email addresses to contact. <clears throat> We're really happy to answer your questions about it now or later. I should let you know that this event is being recorded. So just if you're in the room, it just has a back of your head. But um, what you say will be recorded and we'd like to make these available to people um, online afterwards as well so they can catch up if they're not able to come. So what we'll do today is just give you an introduction to our department from that postgraduate perspective, a little bit different than if you're an undergraduate, for instance, you see you kind of see the department slightly differently and you experience it differently as well. And then we'll have a bit of uh, detail about psychology of advertising master's course in particular that Leslie will provide. And um, then we'll just have uh, some opportunity for questions and answers. And um, I've got some questions for Leslie as well if there's time. OK. Hmm. Hello. That's OK. Come in. <laughs> so this event is being recorded. OK, so. And um, so if you join us as a postgraduate, then these are some of the people that you will meet. We have quite a large team uh, involved in supporting our postgraduate courses in terms of teaching and administrative support as well. So some of the most important people you'll meet as a postgraduate student in our department are these two people at the top left of the screen. That's Claire and Nadine, and they run our postgraduate office and they're available all the time when you're a postgraduate student to answer your queries and to support your learning and point you in the right direction. And actually, if you're thinking about applying for a postgraduate as well, then those are the people you can go to as well. They can give you all the information you'll need. Another of the really important people here, apart from Leslie, of course, in the middle, but is Gina Fisher. She's another of our key contacts in the department. So you can contact her anytime. Um, she's in the bottom right uh, picture. Contact her anytime and she can direct you to a meeting with uh, the right person in our department about your query. So as a postgraduate, you get much more involved in the research side of a department. And they're the kind of research facilities that you have to support your work become more important as well than, for example, as an undergraduate. And in psychology here at Lancaster, uh, we're rated as 100% in the most recent assessment of our research and research facilities as internationally excellent or world leading. And part of that is due to our building, which is this picture at the top here. And this is dedicated entirely to research and training. And as a postgraduate student, you have the opportunity to work in this building quite extensively. And the ground floor is the studies on infants and child labs. Um, that's the lobby if you go in the ground floor of this building, the bottom picture. And the top floor is more for our studies of adults. And we have the latest neurophysiological and cognitive equipment to support your studies. And some of that is really critical for looking at contemporary studies in psychology of advertising. So for example, electroencephalography or functional near infrared spectroscopy, where you can look at the activation of the brain while people respond to different stimuli, for example, different marketing materials. We also have lots of eye tracking, which has been used quite extensively in psychology of advertising projects, for instance. And we've got those world leading child testing labs as well. If, you're, if your research interests uh, during your degree take you in the direction of developmental work. So in our department, we have a whole range of different expertise. And I think this is an important characteristic of our department that we have people working in different areas of psychology. So regardless of the particular interests you have in psychology, you can find someone in our department to support you in those interests. So in yellow, for instance, we have our language and cognition group, and they're interested in those sort of yellow leaves there, sort of language and literacy, behavioral regulation. We also have our red group, the social processes group, interested in um, social behavior, infancy and early development, 
in green and perception and action in grey. So regardless of the kind of interest you have, you can find someone in our department to support your work. We also, much more important as a postgraduate and an undergraduate student, I think, is the global outlook of a department as well. And this graph here shows the active collaborations that people in our department currently have with researchers in other countries. So every continent in the world is represented in terms of our links. And if you join us as a postgraduate and get involved in the work of, of uh, our department consequently, then you get to pick up on these uh, global interconnections, which is a really interesting, important part of, of your development and of your networking as, uh, as you go forward. Global working marketplace. So we have four master's degrees and today we're concentrating on psychology of advertising. I think I pass over to you now, Leslie, to give a bit more detail about that. <clears throat> Sound good. Cool, thank you. Um, so the psychology of advertising, um, the, the basic premise of this course is to um, have a, a really deep dive into the principles within psychology that um, are applied in advertising. And by advertising, it's a fairly um, broad um, definition we use, but persuasive communication. Um, and that can be paid, it can be voluntary, it can be people shouting from a, a soapbox. Um, and the principles really by and large are the, are the same. Um, within uh, a psychology department, it's really unusual to look at advertising, um, maybe in passing, uh, but that's about it. It's a fairly unique master's in that respect. You can study advertising in management schools all over the world. Uh, there are very, very few, and none in Europe that I'm aware of, uh, masters uh, that, that focus on advertising within psychology. So um, we don't have any anyone to compare ourselves with, uh, really. And we just think we're the top of the tree because of that, um, inevitably. Um, so we look across the board of you know, contemporary advertising uh, and history of advertising. Um, but as you may have realized, advertising has changed massively in the last 20 years or so because of the advent of um, online uh, influencers in particular. And the whole landscape is fragmented. If you go back 20, 25 years, certainly there was TV, there was film and posters and press, and that was it really, um, by and large. And now there's like huge numbers of channels within those and across the internet, obviously. So it's kind of, it's interesting. It's, it's allowed new forms of communication to uh, come to the fore, as well as, you know, a real focus down on the original principles and the original um, bits of psychology that apply to that. And in essence, you know, we're talking about, um, if you think about the process of advertising and how you're exposed to it, how you see it, um, getting people's attention in the first place, so kind of cutting through the, the noise out there, which is increasingly difficult given the fragmentation that's happening. Um, getting people to pay attention to what you're saying, what your, your message is to your brand, remembering that, um, making that persuasive, making that something that's going to cut through and make people want to at least consider uh, purchase or changing behavior depending on what your, your focus is, um, and feeding through right to things like loyalty and how you generate that and how you get people to continue to um, develop an engagement with your brand. Um, advertising, you know, if you say that to people, the TV advertising comes to mind in particular and increasingly social media, but it's it's really a wide, very wide range of things we're looking at. Um, we dip into the kind of leading edge of uh, psychology that, that applies to advertising, so in particular, um, social psychology inevitably, and um, behavioural economics increasingly. Although um, it's kind of a, a, a subset of uh, social psychology in a way, it's very fashionable within the advertising world. Um, the advertisers think they've got something that it makes sense and they can sell to their clients, so they, they mine it and because of that we, we teach it, uh, which is kind of one of the principles of the course. Uh, I, I still work in advertising, I work part time here, part-time in advertising and because of that I can kind of pick up on the, the themes that have uh, credibility and um, traction within the industry 
and then introduce them to the course uh, and adjust the course each year uh, accordingly. So we kind of trim into the wind uh, each time we do it. In all that, um, I see my role in the course as taking people from uh, an academic perspective, which is what you get with undergraduate psychology by and large, into a, a phase where they can um, actually apply those things in the real world in advertising. Um, and it's, it's a very applied masters. Um, it, it gives you the ability to go into an agency and work productively. And I've worked in many agencies over the years where undergrads, psychology undergrads, any undergrad really come in and they spend six months kind of making the coffee because they don't have the right mindset. They still have the student mindset uh, and things are kind of idealized and that's not how the real world works. So I midwife people into the, the position where they can actually be effective and hit the ground running. Um, and the other major uh, benefit of doing this master's is it takes your head and shoulders above all the other um, applicants for advertising jobs, marketing jobs, um, who have good um, first degrees uh, in psychology, which is very relevant to the whole field, obviously. None of my um, students have problems getting interviews. I mean, they may not get the job, exactly the job they want at the end of it, but they don't have problems getting interviews because it's such a unique course and it gets you through the door. You then have to convince people you're the right person. Um, and our, our record on, on um, employment is really very good. Um, it's, we lose touch with some people if they go back to um, their, their home countries if they're overseas students. So we don't have a 100% record of what people are doing, but of the people we know, about 98% of them are working either in advertising or consumer research or marketing more generally. Um, and the other two percent are doing PhDs, uh, so they kind of stay within um, the academic world. So quick outline of what the course entails. Uh, these are the, the modules and the, the um, over two terms and the dissertation runs from after Easter right across the summer with a submission date, uh, usually the first week in September. <clears throat> Excuse me. So psychology advertising is the kind of core uh, module with the whole thing. It holds it all together. It's taught by a range of people within the department. As Patrick said, said there's a, a range of skills we have and we, we mine uh, those skills uh, effectively to bring the best we can to teach on that module. Um, attention memory, uh, how people uh, form uh, relationships with, with brands uh, and how people change their behaviours, um, really the core of advertising. Advanced advertising theory, uh, which is what you like to teach. Um, so I'm a seasoned advertising professional, as it says here. Uh, you can tell that, can't you, looking at me? Um, <laughs> it's, it's really looking at the, the theory that underpins what happens in advertising and what has happened over the last 50, 60, 70 years or so, um, because it's quite a, a new discipline in many ways. 70 years sounds like antique, but it's actually, you know, the stuff that happened then still um, pertain within the current environment. Uh, so we do look at um, psychodynamic theories because Freud is still out there. The people that lead agencies still believe in Freud and Jung and some of the, the more scurrilous um, acolytes in that area. So we, do, we look at those areas, um, not because it's science, not because we want you to do that, but because you need to know that uh, to, to work effectively in the industry. The practical aspects module, which is just starting up now, uh, the students work in small teams over the, the uh, term two, working for external clients on a real brief. So this is a kind of first taste of the real world and what it's like out there. Um, this, this year, we've got uh, one team working on um, the representation of sexual imagery in advertising um, right across the last three decades and how that's changed uh, along with the uh, changes uh, in society that underpin those, that allow those, that, that precipitate those. Because advertising kind of follows uh, as well as, as influencing culture, it follows the developments inevitably. It needs to be close to its consumers so it's effective. So changes in, in society are reflected in change in advertising. So this is one, one we're looking at at the moment. Um, but each, each year we have different relationships with different clients that give us interesting projects. Um, analyzing interpreting is a kind of stats course. And if you've done undergrad psychology, this will be familiar territory. Uh, uses R um, and, and teachers uh, R 
um, and really it's the stats you need um, and the level you need to work it effectively. And I mean, planning in an agency, planning is the bit that sits between consumers and the creative department. And you tell, can tell the creators what the consumers think, believe, want, desire, dream about here. Um, so this is how you uh, use that data in a statistical, statistical sense um, and, and portray it uh, to, to uh, clients ultimately. Um, conduct and presenting is a wide ranging um, module that covers a whole bunch of different things, some of which are really relevant to uh, psychology advertising, some of which are more relevant to ethics within psychology, which are very appropriate. You have to uh, apply ethical rules today gathering out in the real world as well as you do within psychology. And each year, each uh, second term, we have a range of options. So these change depending on availability of staff. Um, and as you'd be aware, staff take sabbaticals, they have maternity leave, etc. Uh, sometimes up and leave uh, for no good reason. Um, so depending on who's available, uh, we have a range of, of options uh, each year. They're roughly in this area. Uh, and like talking text has been the same. I think it's an option for 10 years now, um, as, as literature review, which really is a, exactly what it sounds like, uh, 4,000 words, looking at an area that you find particularly interesting without any experimentation. So it's just really mining literature. Um, looking at uh, interpreting psychological data, so kind of advanced stats, if you were swaps, I think, but that's just my take on it. Um, and social psychology, and in particular, social psychology is useful where um, if our students don't have a background in psychology, if you have, it may not be the right module. Um, if you want an easy ride, it might be, um, but you know, you'll have covered it already if you've done undergrad psychology. Um, but in essence, we have a lot of students on the course who haven't done psychology. They may have had a, a minor course within psychology. We also have people who've done geography and nothing to do with psychology or history. You know, there's a whole range of people we, we will consider for the, uh, the masters. Uh, and if they haven't got that background, then that's a really good option to take to get them up to speed, along with um, psycholo psychology of advertising uh, in, in term one. And the dissertation, uh, this is a, a large part of the, uh, the masters. This is 40 odd percent of your marks. So a really significant element within it. Uh, working on an, an area of interest to you. If it dovetails with some of the skills and experience we have within the department, that's great um, because you can work with the people that, that have done that uh, research and often advance their research with them. Um, if it doesn't, if it's something that you particularly want to work on yourself, usually we can accommodate that. Um, and if I'm honest, usually I'm the one that accommodates that because I, I don't have a, a research interest. Um, so I'm kind of without portfolio in that respect. And I know um, people find advertising fascinating in areas that don't necessarily overlap with some of my colleagues' interests. So I'm always very happy and very open to supervising people uh, in an area that, that is genuinely interesting. I'm a bit weak on stats, if I'm honest. I'm a qualitative researcher by, by trade. Um, so um, it, it tends to be more in that area that I, I supervise. But occasionally I'll, put, I'll dip my foot in the water of t-tests and all that malign stuff if I really have to. Some of the recent projects we've had um, looking at online influencers quite centrally and the effect they have and how they should position themselves, which is really interesting. Uh, we've done several projects on charities, uh, looking at their databases and how they should, should position themselves to get more donations or simply to offer a better um, uh, service to their, their clientele. Um, last year we did fast fashion and veganism and a whole move toward veganism across a whole range of different areas. Uh, which is taking place even as we speak. Uh, inevitably, a couple of years ago during lockdown, we looked at COVID um, and vaccine hesitancy, what that was all about, and how you effectively communicate to persuade people to do the right thing, um, and what the barriers are and what the triggers would be, what you say to people to get them to do uh, the thing you want. So although you know most advertising is about selling things to people, Inevitably, there's a kind of public service announcement uh, element, element within the two. We looked at ASMR and how that uh, is used in advertising. I have to say, not very effectively at the moment, but there are some good examples of it. Uh, there's a good Brazilian ad for McDonald's uh, with an influencer sitting there, really, and speaking to the microphone, scratching the box, and taking a bite from a, a McCrunchy. I think it's called a McCrispy. 
um, which lends itself to that whole area of ASMR, which is interesting. I'm desperate to experience it. I don't, I'm not an ASMR experiencer. So I keep trying and trying different things, but you know, I'm not there yet. Um, I need bigger headphones, I think that's the thing. Um, we looked at fast fashion and the ethics of all that and yeah, the, the influence that advertising has on that, which is considerable. You know, that's the, one of the things that drives that whole um, consumption cycle. And one of the objections that people have to um, advertising in general is that it's, it's selling you things that you don't really want or need. So you didn't know you wanted or needed, needed them. And then they end up in landfill in a couple of months. And there is some of that. There is, you know, marketing capitalism in general has that um, charge, I think, to answer. And advertising is a kind of fairly neutral uh, tool. Uh, and it can be used well or used um, ill, uh, I think. Both things apply in the marketplace in the moment. By by covering these topics within this course, my genuine hope is that the alumni from the course will go out and make a difference in the world because you can do advertising well. You can apply it well. You can use it in a, effectively as a tool to in a pro-social way as well as simply selling more Mars bars. Mars bars. So point for me. I've done a lot of work for Mars in the past. I don't know what I feel about them now. Um, looking at just the, the whole area of uh, how you become more creative and how you apply that uh, in the marketplace. Um, hits the subculture when that was a big thing a couple of years ago. Everyone had big beards and what that meant and how that was defined. Um, gender representation and sexual imagery, as I say, and advertising are working on that at the moment. And also this last area, which is, is a bit weird, but I, I find it fascinating. There's a whole industry uh, called futuring, and it's aligned with um, consumer research and advertising. And it's really about um, predicting the future as best you can. So uh, it, one term for it is cool hunting. So it's looking for emergent semiotic codes in society that you can kind of latch onto and put your brand against so that as they rise, your brand rises. Um, it's, it's kind of as simple as that and as complicated as that because you know, predicting what's going to happen tomorrow for me is a bit tricky, but you know, some people make predictions three, four, five years away, and with some accuracy. Um, you know, they can tell you certainly what the colour for next spring will be already, and the specialists that do that, I don't know how they do it, um, but I, I think it's a pendulum and they sort of swing it down things. People uh, that have hosted our um, enterprises in the past, the NHS inevitably, um, some housing associations there, uh, some, some lot of uh, the Brook uh, Sexual Health Clinic uh, gives a couple of projects um, very interesting to work on. Uh, a couple of um, local authorities in London, which is very interesting because their communications, you know, it's like you've seen them from councils and it's all these complicated terms and here's and for with and on the seventh inst and people don't read them. They put them behind the bed bin and then get fined or lose their houses because they're, they're they just come around. So we were looking at how to make clear and persuasive and effective communications for those people with really good effect. Uh, so I'm looking at the, the whole impact of uh, the use of bailiffs uh, for Hammersmith and Fulham because they were trying very hard to stop using them and we were trying to help them. And I think they've taken steps in that direction uh, more than most uh, local authorities. So a whole bunch of different people. Blood bikes was an interesting project uh, last year. And blood bikes are the people that ride around on motorbikes and take blood and other vital fluids from one hospital to another and organs and that kind of thing. And uh, they were looking for how they got more volunteers. So we were designing communications to infuse people in that respect. Uh, so the brands we worked on, I mean, these are a few of them really. These are the main ones that we kind of come across every year uh, and, and drill down into. Look at what they've been doing in advertising in the past, now and what they might do in the future uh, and analyzing their, their strategies against each other and for assessed work. So if that's what's going on, I'm just going to try and show you how that applies in the marketplace. Uh, I think that's the work. So I put that forward as a, a 
a really good example of a kind of really basic way that advertising works, which is to um, give you a really warm feeling about a brand and a, a warm feeling and then transfer it to the brand. So the next time you see the brand, there's a little bit of the echo of that feeling. So it's kind of a classical condition, really. Um, in this case, there is some noise around that because there's this fantastically lovely warm feeling of all these little kittens purring and they bite the biscuit. And it's like, it's like they're biting the kittens, people keep saying. And there, it, it really is, but that's the theory. That's what is supposed to happen. All that warm feeling is supposed to transfer to the brand at that point because that's when you see the product and the consumption. So a lot, of, a lot of bands work that way, without any doubt, they work that way and they're very effective. Um, but in the real world, you know, it's, it's much more complicated than that. And some ads uh, are very complicated. You can see here, if I'm not the right one. So I'm not pretending I understand what's happening there necessarily. But you can see it's quite complex psychology and it's designed to sell vodka. Now that's, that's the basis of it. Um, it's also a kind of cultural artifact. You know, it's a piece of art, actually. I mean, whether you like the art or not, it's a different thing, but it, it is um, art. And advertising is a mix of art and science, you know, in the way we assess it, in the way we kind of... Um, build it on a, a, a solid platform of understanding, you could say it's a science. But at the same time, the people that work in creative agencies and creative departments or agencies regard themselves as artists, without a doubt. Um, and I think that's a fairly good example. They also appropriate bits of psychology that sometimes are a bit um, out of date, I guess. Um, but still, that's that's the way it's applied in the marketplace. So we'll appreciate the Freudian overtones in that one, I'm sure. Um, sometimes, and increasingly, advertising is used uh, quite deliberately uh, to make a pro-social message while trying to sell you something at the same time. So uh, I think if you go back 10 years or so, this, this wouldn't have happened. But over that last decade, uh, there's much, much more of uh, this kind of advertising going on.
So they're not pretending they're not trying to sell you something. Um, initially, I think people objected to it on that basis, but they're selling it. They're, they're positioning themselves in a way that um, appeals to people who have a heightened awareness, more of a social conscience, perhaps. Certainly, um, there's a, a very direct pro-social message in it, uh, despite the fact that it's about soap um, and, and a bit trivial uh, to that extent. But there's a, a, a number of ads that are saying like that at the moment. Um, and they reflect society. Advertising inevitably does. Uh, it's not trying to lead society. If it did that, I think it would depart from its engagement with its consumers. Um, however, the, the society in which we exist, um, and Western society in particular, has changed. And I think advertising has, has taken steps in the same direction. And in doing so, reflects back uh, those changes and amplifies them to a degree, because more and more people see that uh, as abnormal and therefore to be avoided. And other ads reflect it as well. So it's a kind of internal mechanism. Other advertising can't then show beautiful women uh, with very few clothes on and expect not to be pilloried. So it does have an effect um, in, in uh, leading in that respect within advertising. It applies to other areas as well as um, female representations. So I'm not arguing that this kind of approach is going to change the world. You know, it requires more than that. It requires the world to change in order that this can happen, in order that this can be um, acceptable in advertising terms. But it is really powerful. And advertising is. It, is, it succeeds by making us feel something. If you don't feel anything, you look at an ad, it hasn't worked. We make decisions based on our emotions and changes in our emotions. Ads like this make you confront your own stereotypes. It certainly did for me, I have to say. Really, the first time I saw it, I expected them to be in the dock. It genuinely did. And it made me realise, you know, what my expectations were. Advertising is not the only thing that does this, of course. It's one of the vectors in, in society. Um, and it can be part of a positive aspect of, of communication. Selling Mars bars, I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know how they, they haven't done it yet. Um, they do do fair trade now. They, you know, Mars, all Mars chocolates are traded. Maybe they're moving in that direction. Um, but it's still, you know, it's a bar of chocolate and it gives pleasure to people. It really does, as well as doing some harm. And most products have, have that balance about them. You know, most consumer products do harm and do, do some good as well. Um, it's a, a very fine, finely balanced line. And once you draw a line in the sand, it's quite hard to, to not realize you're stepping over it all the time. So um, I, I try not to, um, except, you know, people have got their own internal compasses about these things. I suppose where I end up is it's a really powerful thing. And if I can help 
to influence my students to do it well and to do it to tell the truth well and in areas that are not simply about selling more products um, I think that's the job I'm, I'm seeking to do <clears throat> this is not really selling anything and yet So a public information film sponsored by a brand, an irrelevant brand, who's, you know, some of the, if it's Mars, may not work quite as well, but, you know, Volkswagen. And the essence of it is they want you to feel better about Volkswagen. The Volkswagen is inherently a safe brand. That's a, a core attribute of it. And that's helping to cement that in place um, without doubt. So it's there to help sell, you know, without doubt. Companies are charged by law with maximizing shareholder value, maximizing profit. They have to do that by law. That's that's the state we're in. That's a way of doing it in a way that all, it benefits people as well as making profit. Okay, And I think the best advertising in the world does exactly that. So, by Lancaster. Um, it is a unique master's, as I say. Uh, it's within a psychology environment as opposed to a management school. Management schools are good, but they do focus differently on the nuts and bolts of, you know, how you make the company work rather than the psychology that underpins that. Um, we have me. Um, I work in advertising still um, and, and consumer research. I'm working on a brand called LATAM at the minute, which is a, a kind of regional airline for Latin America. Just formed three years ago. We're developing their brand essence um, right across that region and Germany, UK, US, Spain. Uh, I'm working on that project actively. So I do understand what's happening out there. I do understand and I bring it back into the, the practicalities of the course. Um, as Patrick said, we've got a whole bunch of um, clever kit that we can use and we do use. Um, mobile eye tracking is particularly interesting. If you go down a high street with these things on, it shows you where you're looking. And apart from the odd, you know, odd um, experience of people you know, looking at some woman walking past, which is a bit embarrassing when you see the film afterwards, um, it, it gives you a heat map of where your dwell is. And uh, it, it, buses going past, you look at them and you see what's on the side. And that feeds into the understanding that people have of where you put your ads. So it's a poster, it's a, a shell um, sign on a, a side of a bus shelter, or it's a, something going by. You have different frequencies of, of Ks, clearly. Um, our course is ESRC approved. And as I said, a few of our graduates each year go on to do a PhD. Uh, and you can do that you can get funding on that basis uh, without any barrier um, but you know in truth most of the people that do this course are going to get a job in advertising that's what it, uh, the whole course is about and that's what, what we're um, focusing on in the whole thing um, yeah so 96 percent of my grades sorry i got that wrong um, and now in either commercial sector or public sector um, or a couple in doctoral studies and some of the oh, yeah. You should do it because you know. um, some of the people that uh, have employed our, our alumni and still employ our alumni over the years. So some big names in Adidas and has a brush, BBC, um, called Bank. And we buy any car.com. That's a recent um, entry. I don't really know what the job is yet. I'll find out. We're, we're in you know, really good touch with our 
uh, alumni, not least because I'm still working in this area, so I come across them every so often. Um, and indeed, I'm working with one of them now on the LATAM project. She's working for the uh, agency Mesh uh, that, that is uh, commissioning the, the research. So it's quite a small world, quite a um, intense um, experience and focus, but that's all to the good from our point of view. Back to Patrick. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. So I'm just going to do the boring <laughs> final bits now, just uh, some of the practicalities, and then hopefully there's a little bit of time for questions afterwards. So um, you should be aware of the different kinds of funding that's available to support your postgraduate study at Lancaster, and some of these apply to students who are already at Lancaster or are alumni of Lancaster University, others are open to other people. Um, uh, I'll leave you to follow this link for a bit more detail about these so that we do have a little bit of time. In terms of entry requirements for this programme, Psychology of Advertising Masters, then you need a first or two one degree from um, in any relevant discipline associated with Psychology of Advertising or its international equivalent. So what's really nice about the Psychology of Advertising program is it has students from all these different backgrounds and they come together with their different background expertise and work together in groups, as Leslie says, and it's really nice to have that, that multiple perspective in that, in that group. I really enjoy teaching them, actually. Um, so first or two, one degree in any relevant discipline, you don't have to have a psychology first degree for this program. But please ask us about alternatives because we're, we're willing to support anyone to join the programme who we think would really thrive in that programme. So don't decide yourself. Uh, it's not for you. Let us talk to you about it first. Uh, you need an English language overall score of seven, but there are routes again to support your language if you're not quite at that level. And uh, non-standard applications are welcomed and we treat them all on an individual case by case basis. If you have any questions at any point about the admission process, you can email pgadmissions at lancaster.ac.uk. So how to apply is pretty easy. You just go to our portal, which is the link at the bottom of this page. If you're outside Lancaster University, you have to pay an administrative fee, £40 to submit your application to cover the administrative costs. If you're a Lancaster University student, you're already in our system, so there's no administrative fee to apply. And also for Lancaster University students, we have a particular um, easy application process because you're within our system. So for example, you don't need references and you don't need an academic transcript because we can pick those up internally. And also for Lancaster University students, we have a guaranteed offer scheme that you will get a place if you meet the requirements. We guarantee that. And also in terms of the bursaries, if you're a Lancaster University student, then you're guaranteed the scholarship associated uh, with your eligibility and we, we apply the best one to you. If you have more questions, ask them now, or at any point you can chat with a student at Lancaster University through Lancaster Connect, and that link at the top. You can chat with a member of staff on a one-to-one -one basis at any point about any of our master's and uh, PhD programmes. And to do that, contact Gina, g.fisher1 at lancaster.ac.uk, and she'll point you and set up a meeting between you and a member of staff to talk about it more. You can contact uh, Claire and Nadine in our postgraduate office team at any point at postgraduate.psychology at lancaster.ac.uk. Of course, look at our brochure. OK, so are there any questions from the room or online? I think Johnny will pick them up. None coming through yet. And if not, I have some questions for Leslie. Yeah. Yeah, Leslie. <coughs> so, current year, or the enforced students? Yeah, the enforced students this year. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. So, we have four students this year, which is unusual, um, to say the least. In, over the past 10 years, which is where I've been involved, uh, we've gone from, I think we had seven at one point, to 25. And the 
median is probably about 18, 17 or 18. Um, no, that's not true. Uh, no, less than that. 12, 14, I would say. So on average, I would guess about 12. Um, so this year, I think uh, a number of the master's numbers are down. Um, you're not quite sure why. Um, Chinese students um, perhaps not playing the same numbers. And each year we have about a third of the course. Yeah, about a third of the third, roughly speaking, Chinese uh, uh, students on the course. About a third from other overseas um, destinations and about a third uh, UK. And other destinations can be India, Pakistan, America, South America, Europe, um, but almost anywhere actually um, in the Far East. Are you a current student? Psychology. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. Let's just pass the microphone back to the board. So, so. I've got my questions for you. So, I, mean, I think another of the big difference is at postgraduate level is that you are in these smaller cohorts and you do then interact with staff in a much more uh, close way. And also, you know, you really get. Uh, close collaborations and relationships with the other people on your course. So when I was doing a master's out, that was such an appealing thing for me. That small, that focus and that real connection with the, the staff in the department as well. I really enjoyed that. So yeah, it does fluctuate. Overall, we have about 50 um, postgraduate students, master's students, and that goes up and down a little bit each year, but it means that we, you know, we can um, support them extremely well. Um, whichever program they, they're on. So can I ask you, Leslie, do you have a favourite advert? <laughs> um, I have several, actually, but I really like the... They're old, I mean, that's the trouble. I, most of my favourites are old, and they tend to be ones I've worked on. Um, Naturally. Yeah. The, British Airways ad from 1988, I think it was, um, where they they showed the whole of Manhattan uprooted, uprooted and flying across the Atlantic. Um, that was one of my favorite. Um, favorite in its artistic interpretation, but also in its strategy, because it kind of personalized the fact that this is real people, there's a really large number of people that they fly across the Atlantic. Um, but it's just beautiful as well. Um, and I really like all the flake ads, and I worked on those before, but they're very powerful. They're very, very powerful ads. Um, and yeah, of course, they're a bit sexual. Um, or they're interpreted as being sexual anyway. I mean, I don't think that was the original strategy, but it's become a yeah. uh, kind of meme, really. But some of them are very beautiful, too. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd say those are the two areas I would go to. Right. And um, in terms of teaching on the programme, what do you enjoy teaching most of all in this, this course? I'm not sure it's it's teaching exactly, but bringing people's awareness to the, the details that are in ads, because ads are always, and I'm thinking film and, and, and TV in particular, um, so big budget ads, they are the most expensive films ever made, you know, by a factor of 100. Um, every second, every, you know, segment of a second is really finely tuned to get the maximum value because they cost so much to make and they cost so much to put on air. So they'll, you know, typical ad will cost, I don't know, uh, half a million maybe for a big budget one, one minute ad. Um, and they'll spend another eight, nine, 10 million on putting on air. So it needs to be fantastic. And they are, they're really finely scrubbed and, and um, organized. Um, so it's, when you're just sitting at home and you've had a glass of wine and you just watch it, you don't see those things. They have an impact. Every little element has an impact, but you don't see it. So it's bringing people's awareness to that. And, and it's like deconstructing them to see what's there, what the meta messaging is and what it means. Um, and after the first term, really, we do a lot of that in um, ad, ad theory. Uh, and in the first term, people are kind of doing it. And they can't stop doing it. They can't help it. Then they can't not see it once you, you see it in the yeah. cube effect. Yeah, it's sort of peeling back the, the layers to see what's underneath. Interesting. 
Yeah. I think we'd better stop there, we're kind of out of time, but if you have follow-up questions, then do contact us. Um, we're really happy to, to hear more questions that you might have. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Leslie. Oh, uh, yeah, if you do have time to give us some feedback on this, if you have more questions, you can follow up through a, a very short questionnaire here. Thanks.